Uh, welcome to everybody who's on the line for our Bay Area Breast Cancer Forum. Uh, we have a great forum tonight. We're talking about the American Society of Clinical Oncology 2019 uh, virtual meeting results. And uh, as you know, all of our meetings now have been virtual. And um, we, but we had all presenters who had recorded their presentations and uh, questions and answers and lots of discussion on Twitter, et cetera. And I think you'll find this evening's session really interesting. We're doing something new because of the COVID pandemic. And I think that we're hopeful that you'll like this uh, approach using Zoom. The only thing that it doesn't allow is for everybody to speak because it would be impossible. But what we've done instead is actually purchased a license through Zoom where if you look on the bottom of your screen, you can see questions and answers. So you can actually put up a question and answer anytime you want. You can address it to a specific person or a specific question, and we'll go through your questions and answers, both written and uh, if the questions seem appropriate for the whole audience, we'll talk about them on the uh, chat as well with our panel. So uh, hopefully if anybody has trouble with the, uh, with the Q&A part, uh, please uh, look up you can send us a note in chat and Melody will be happy to help you. I wanted to first introduce Melody Gallu, who's the, uh, been uh, really wonderful and has donated her time to uh, coordinating the forum and to purchasing our license for the Zoom through philanthropic funding uh, and through just making this happen through all of the emails that I know you get from her. So we really want to thank Melody, who's got the ocean behind her in her virtual scene uh, and uh, go on with our uh, ASCO update. So this is the uh, Bay Area Breast Cancer Forum. It's open to anybody who wants to participate. And what we do is we talk about uh, topics interesting to uh, patients and family members, uh, interested individuals, caretakers, et cetera, related to breast cancer. We love you to provide your ideas and interests in various topics. So please do send emails to, Natal uh, to um, uh, Melody. Uh, who has the email invite list. If you want to have other people put on the list, please feel free to let her know because she can add additional emails to the list. Uh, we have a great panel. Um, it happens to be all female, which is also wonderful. Uh, we have Joe Chen. I uh, just want to wave at everybody who's uh, a, and uh, Michelle Malisco. And Natalie Marshall, the newest member of our team, who's actually, uh, we're all breast medical oncologists at UCSF. And Natalie Marshall is actually leading our breast oncology group in the East Bay at UCSF's extension programs, where we have uh, clinics now in the East Bay and in the South Bay, as well as the uh, further East Bay, I suppose I could say. And uh, so Natalie has a clinic there, uh, which is uh, working very well, and also has a clinic in our uh, practice at, uh, in Mission Bay, uh, one day a week. So it's been really great to have her and she'll be participating as well. So without uh, further ado, we'll start and uh, actually Joe Chen is going to start uh, and talk about uh, some of the really interesting studies that were presented uh, regarding uh, two really uh, broad areas. So she's going to talk about a genomic panel that we use to try and determine benefit from chemotherapy. Uh, called Mammoprint or the 7G gene assay, and there was an updated presentation by our colleague in Portugal. And then two interesting studies uh, about uh, endocrine therapy, which I think uh, you'll find quite interesting. And she'll also, uh, well, one study about endocrine therapy and talk about how that actually applies to some work that she's doing here. And then a fascinating new agent for HER2 positive breast cancer that appears to be uh, helping patients who have uh, brain metastases as well as others. So uh, we'll hear all about that. So what I'm going to do uh, is to uh, share my screen uh, so you'll be able to see uh, what she has to present uh, in these slides. So presumably everybody can uh, see the slides now. And Joe, uh, go ahead. Hold on, let me just, okay, great. All right, can everyone hear me? You guys hear yeah. me? Okay. Okay, so um, as Hope said, I'm going to start with the MIND Act trial. So I'm gonna just sort of set the stage. Um, you know, one of the types of breast cancers that I've become particularly interested in are ER positive, HER2 negative, early stage breast cancers that present as either large tumors or node positive. So what we would call clinically high risk, meaning relatively a large amount of disease. And yet when we profile the tumor, as we now 
often do where we send either MAMPRINT or there's other tests like Oncotype where we really look at the gene expression to tell us is this a biologically aggressive or less aggressive tumor. We find that many of these tumors that are ER positive, HER2 negative, and large or node positive actually have low risk biology. And what we've learned about this kind of biology is that they may be less sensitive to chemotherapy, benefit less from chemo, and have overall potentially a better prognosis. Um, so the MINDAG trial really set to answer this, right? Do these large tumors benefit at all from chemotherapy? And um, this was a international trial. Patients who had either large node positive tumors and molecular low risk were randomized to either chemo or no chemo. Hope you can go to the next slide. Um, and just so you know, I'm pulling these slides from the original presentations from ASCO. Um, and so I, I've chosen select slides to, to present here. And this summarizes the design of this particular presentation where clinically low, meaning myomaprint low risk, um, but genomically, sorry, on the right hand, so clinically high risk, genomically low risk. They enrolled about 1,500 patients. This is the panel on the right. And these patients were randomized um, to either get chemotherapy or no chemotherapy. So about 750 patients in each arm. Next slide. So on this left side, it'll show you the types of um, patients that were enrolled. So about 500 to 577 are premenopausal. Um, most had over two centimeters of disease. About a third were high grade. About half had node positive disease. And these were all felt to be clinically high risk, meaning a large burden of disease that may have a higher risk of recurrence. Next slide. And first, what they showed was that at five years, when they looked to see what percentage of patients were recurrence-free, meaning didn't have a distant recurrence and were alive, these patients did really well. At five years, 95% of them were distant metastasis-free, meaning recurrence-free. And that's an excellent outcome for these patients that had clinically high-risk disease. And what we learned from the initial presentation was that whether or not they got chemo, the five-year recurrence-free outcome was similar, around 95%. So what this study did, the new presentation, was to report the follow-up at eight and a half years, meaning when you follow these patients even longer, did we see a benefit from chemotherapy emerge? Next slide. And what they found was actually really interesting. So if you look at the panel on the left, first it'll say, you know, what was the distant metastasis-free survival at five years? And as you can see, ACT chemo is in red, and then no ACT chemo is in blue. And you can say, again, at five years, the same, around 95% were recurrence-free and alive. And then you go to eight years, which is, you know, the uh, column on the right, and there's a small difference uh, between the chemo in red and the no chemo in blue. So that difference is about 2.6% at eight years. So slightly higher as you follow these patients out a little bit longer. Next slide. And so the question is, well, does age have something to do with this? So they looked at patients who were over 50 and then 50 and younger. And if you, let's start on the right-hand side. For patients who are over 50, they found that at eight years, there was no difference as well. So 90% of these patients were distant metastasis-free. So again, excellent outcome for a clinically high-risk group. And for these women who were likely mostly postmenopausal, there was no difference as to whether or not they got chemo or not. Now, if you move over to the left-hand side, you'll see for these women who were 50 and younger who were likely premenopausal or perimenopausal, there is a slightly larger difference at eight years. 
So that difference now is around 5% between those who got chemo and those who didn't, favoring the chemo arm. So this was really interesting and somewhat unexpected, but why would this be? And why would there be a difference between over 50 and 50 and younger? And what we hypothesize, although not proven in this study, but what has been hypothesized and also supported by other studies that have looked at similar things, is that possibly this difference is due to ovarian suppression from chemotherapy in premenopausal women. We know that in premenopausal women with ER positive disease that have higher risk due to larger tumors or node positivity, that those patients benefit more from a more aggressive hormone therapy approach using ovarian suppression such as uh, Lupron or Zolodex in combination with aromatase inhibitors. And so when we give premenopausal or perimenopausal women chemo, likely that will put a large portion of those women into menopause and therefore be suppressing their ovaries. The majority of the women on the study received tamoxifen as their adjuvant hormone therapy. So could it be that the chemo added additional benefit for these younger women because we ended up putting them into menopause? So that is um, one of the hypotheses. And the reason that we, we think that might be is that we know from many old, older studies that chemo benefit should be seen in the first five years, okay? And benefit beyond five years is likely more due to an endocrine therapy benefit. And so this hypothesis has been supported by other trials and I think is a very, very reasonable explanation. Um, next slide. So this summarizes what I just showed you. Basically, at, with longer follow-up, we do start seeing a slightly larger uh, benefit from chemotherapy in these patients with clinically high risk, but mammoprint low risk we see that this benefit really is in the pre or the younger women under 50, so likely pre or perimenopausal. In the postmenopausal subset, there's no difference, um, even at 8.5 years. Um, and they are doing additional uh, follow-up looking, oh, sorry. Um, then there's the report that there will be additional reports from the other groups like clinically low but genomically high. So I'll stop there for this presentation. Um, do we want to take questions, Hope, after you? Yeah, I think that's a great, a great, a great time, a stopping point um, to just uh, take some questions. I don't seem to be able to get this out of a full screen, but um, I, I think it, you know, one of the questions, there's a few questions on here that um, and I think they relate to each other. So I guess um, I'd ask um, Michelle if this uh, changes anything that you're doing now. And as a sort of an aside, do you also, what percentage of your patients do you estimate that you order a, a molecular, I guess a, a diagnostics test in the early stage setting? So not so much metastatic, but early stage. How many people do you order these on? Does this data change anything? Sure. No, it's a um, great question. I saw that from the audience. So um, to start with, uh, we do obviously order a lot of these um, these types of tests, whether it be Oncotype or Mammoprint. And I think a lot of you know patients are more familiar with the Oncotype because it's been around longer. And um, I think it's so interesting that the breakdown in terms of longer term benefit from chemotherapy kind of falls out in the you know less than age 50 group, which is the same way that was the benefit in the MindAct trial, I mean in the in the Taylor X trial, and so um, to answer the question, I would say that probably for a, a 50 percent of my early stage patients, maybe closer to 60 percent, we get some type of uh, genomic profiling and. The decision about which of those tests that we get, Oncotype or Mammoprint, I think goes back to the slide that was presented earlier that Joe showed, um, that the, the presenters showed as well, that there's a big difference between these trial populations, the Oncotype Taylor X trial being um, exclusively node negative, smaller tumors, you know, median size of you know, less than two centimeters, whereas the MindEye trial included you know, close to 50% node positive patients.
So I do order, I guess, a molecular profiling test or I mean a genomic test like this, a prognostic predictive assay on about 50 to 60 percent um, of my, maybe, maybe approaching 70 percent. And then I have a discussion with a patient about why I'm picking one versus the other. I do think that this data is very interesting in that um, I think I will be recommending chemotherapy slightly more often for patients that come back with mammoprint high-risk tumors, um, I'm sorry, low-print, mammoprint low-risk tumors, if I really am convinced that clinically they're high-risk and they're young. And I think that's kind of what we've been doing. I mean, no one really felt comfortable, um, even though we would order these tests in the context of our clinical trial, iSpy, we'd have a young woman come in, say a 35, 36-year-old with a six-centimeter cancer, and in the context of iSpy, we would order um, a mamma print because it was required for the study, and the patient has a six centimeter cancer and node positive, and she come back mamma print low risk, and therefore she's not eligible for iSpy. But I think we all felt very uncomfortable not recommending chemotherapy for her, and so now this bears out that for women under under fifty, these women, you know, some of them may need chemotherapy, some of them may need don't need chemotherapy, but need ovarian suppression. I think that's the challenge with um, Joe's hypothesis and others' hypothesis is we parse out those women, you know, who we could say, okay, it's just it's just an ovarian suppression effect. Um, so I'm still, well, you know, I as I a, say all the time, clinical judgment, you know. Right, and I think that's really judgment. important. Really what we're seeing here is the knowledge that for women who are postmenopausal, that we can really uh, differentiate out a group of patients who don't benefit from chemotherapy using either the mamma print or oncotype tests. And so that's, that's very helpful. I think what we don't know is when the bulk of disease is a lot greater, so more than three positive nodes or very large tumors, we don't have quite as robust a data set, even in postmenopausal women. But in younger women, who are under the age of 50, we don't know if it's an effective chemotherapy or the chemotherapy ovarian suppression. And so, as Michelle said, we really have to individualize based on the uh, tumor characteristics in the patient. So, uh, Natalie, just a, a quick question is, uh, how does that, how, do you see that these results are pretty consistent with how you interpret the Taylor X data where Oncotype is, was used? Well, I think that the Oncotype data first of all, didn't include as many premenopausal women, didn't include node positive women, and they're actually a population that's much lower risk. So that's one thing about the Oncotype a study with Taylor RX. Um, now they do have a study called Ponder RX, I think, where they're looking at node positive Ponder, patients. Yeah. RX Ponder, yeah, um, I'm dyslexic. So um, no. th that study may give us some more information, but um, I think they're really different populations um, I think that they also saw the effect that in women under 50, that they don't feel comfortable not recommending chemotherapy in those patients. And when they're in the lower risk group, in the postmenopausal, they would. So I, I think it's similar, but I think that the MINDAC trial includes people that are much higher risk. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, they did include the node positive group and you would expect biologically uh, the cancers to be similar, but we also know that there's some tumor heterogeneity. So we always run into problems when there's discordance, like the tumor looks clinically high risk, but is genomically low risk. And as Michelle mentioned, sometimes those, those differences are quite large and it's hard to know. Um, and Joe, just so the final questions for this section is, uh, are there, how does this correlate with the intermediate and low risk groups from Oncotype when you look at the MINDAC uh, data? So, um, remember, so my mamma print is just high and low, okay? So it, it's different than uh, Oncotype where there's an intermediate. And what we know from both of these tests though is that it's a continuous spectrum right even though oncotype does define a low intermediate high and mamma print just the low and high both of them use a continuous score and and i think um, what we've seen certainly with oncotype and what we believe to be also true with mamma print is that the higher that continuous score sort of the higher the risk and likely the higher the benefit from chemotherapy so I, I don't, from, in terms of um, how to compare the two, I don't really compare 
these two. Certainly in the oncotype with the intermediate risk, we did see from Taylor Rx that in younger women, those are the patients, as Natalie said, who may have a slightly a greater benefit from chemotherapy than postmenopausal women. So certainly with the score of 21 to 25, we saw a slightly higher benefit in distant recurrence with women under 50 than over 50 in terms of with chemotherapy. Um, and then, you know, about a 2% difference, mostly local regional in with scores, I think uh, 16 to 20. But the interesting thing that uh, Taylor X showed, which is consistent with MindAct, is that if you looked at the under 50 in Taylor RX using Oncotype, that benefit um, with younger women was greatest for those who were in the 40s as opposed to under 35. And the thought there is that the chemotherapy actually put those women into permanent menopause um, or more sustained menopause as opposed to the under 35 or the young or under 40, the younger women, where it may have been more of a temporary chemo-induced menopause. And then those women recovered their menses and ovarian function. And therefore that chemo benefit was smaller in that, in that group. I mean, these were really small numbers when they're going back to do subset analyses of subset analyses. But I think the underlying hypothesis um, in MindAC supports what was seen in Oncotype or in TaylorRx. Yeah, I think that's such an important point is that, um, you know, we're, we're inferring about the benefits of ovarian suppression and that's where you make your estrogen. So by taking young women who have really high estrogen levels and these cancers seem to be a little bit more aggressive and getting rid of the uh, ovarian production of estrogen, we've already seen that we can improve outcome added to chemotherapy. And the benefit was in particular where we added ovarian suppression to standard endocrine therapy was in women who were under the age of 35. So the same group who just don't go, you know, ovaries are pretty hardy when you're young and you don't go into menopause from the chemotherapy. So it is fascinating. And I think that, you know, we all use ovarian suppression more than maybe a couple of decades ago, depending on how long you've been practicing, uh, because of data that has really um, shown how much ben more beneficial this is in young women. I think it's also a really good thing that we're sparing older women uh, chemotherapy more appropriately now, uh, which I think is really helpful. So with that, let's go on and talk about neoadjuvant endocrine therapy, Joe, an area which you have great interest uh, in, I know. And actually, uh, Joe has uh, organized a a multi-center, meaning at many institutions in the United States, a protocol that's an add-on to our neoadjuvant chemotherapy protocol called iSpy, uh, looking specifically at different uh, neoadjuvant endocrine or hormone therapy approaches. Great, and I'll, I'll try to keep this short. Um, you know, many studies, including the one, you know, the MIND Act one that we just discussed, is hinting at this idea that these ER positive HER2 negative tumors, uh, whether the mammoprint low risk or oncotype intermediate, that they may not benefit as much from chemo. And so maybe we should be double downing on hormone therapy. Maybe we need to be improving the hormone therapy treatment for patients. And so there's a lot of um, effort in studying better hormone therapy in the early stage setting. And Testing hormone therapy in the neoadjuvant setting, meaning before surgery, gives us a really good opportunity to learn about how effective these different treatments are. So right now, as we all know, in the early stage setting, aromatase inhibitors are the standard of care for postmenopausal women. We take it for at least five years. Um, there's uh, other hormone therapies. The one we're going to be talking about today in this trial is fulvestrin or Faslidex. It's approved in the metastatic setting and it's an established regimen in the second and later line setting, in the metastatic setting, um, and also now in the frontline setting in metastatic disease. What Faslidex is, is a estrogen receptor degrader, so it can bind the estrogen receptor and then actually cause it to degrade. So the mechanism of fulvestrin is different than AIs. AIs inhibit the production of estrogen. So because Faslidex has been shown to be effective in the metastatic setting and in some trials has shown to be superior to AIs in the frontline setting, this trial looked at, they, they compared AI versus fulvestrin 
versus the combination of AI and fulvestrin in the neoadjuvant setting. Thanks, Hope. So this is the trial design. It looks very complicated, but I'll just summarize it by saying they enrolled, um, I think it was about 400 in each arm, but we'll have to go look at the next slide. But so three groups, AI alone, so anastrozole alone, fulvestrin alone, and then the combination. And they were treated um, for up to six months and then went to surgery. And this trial was very biomarker heavy in that they would biopsy at three weeks to look at the proliferation of cells, looking at KI-67. And if they felt like the hormone therapy at three weeks was not decreasing proliferation, those patients were pulled out and um, recommended to have chemotherapy. But otherwise, the patients continued on for six months, went to surgery, and they looked at different outcomes to assess whether or not these treatments were effective. And one of the biggest limitations of studying hormone therapy before surgery is that we can't use the same criteria to assess efficacy as we do with chemotherapy. So with chemotherapy, we want to make sure we assess what we call pathologic complete response, meaning we want to see no invasive disease in the breast or in the lymph nodes after the full course of chemo. And if you can achieve that, your risk of recurrence is much lower. We know with hormone therapy, we're unlikely to see full, complete, uh, pathologic complete responses. It doesn't mean you're not benefiting, it's just not the right marker. And one of the things we've been struggling with is trying to figure out what is the right marker. And one of the things that we've looked at is KI-67, which is proliferation, and something called PEPI, which is looking at KI-67. It's, it's like a composite score of KI-67, as well as um, grade, as well as size, lymph node status. Um, I think we can go to the next slide, Hope. And all I'll say about this is that when they looked at the three arms, when you look at, look at the lower um, panels, the PEPI score looking at the composite of proliferation, grade, all of these um, markers that we believe to reflect tumor aggressiveness and response, they were exactly the same in the three arms. There was no statistically significant difference. And if you look at the PCR rate, you know, what we would use for chemotherapy, look at the rates of PCR. It's 0.9%, like 1%. We know that that is not going to be the right marker to use. Can you just define PCR? In, no invasive disease, so no cancer left in the breast or the lymph nodes. Um, so one thing to point out though, which I think is important, if you look at the second and third rows, confirmed PD during neoadjuvant endocrine therapy and discontinued neoadjuvant endocrine therapy early. So you can see, you know, sorry. <laughs> what's important to note is, you know, people ask, well, is there any downside to starting with neoadjuvant hormone therapy as opposed to going to surgery first or, or getting chemo? And you can see only 1% or less than 1% of the patients had growth on hormone therapy. It's very, very, very unlikely. These patients were also monitored very closely, but we do that in the clinic as well. And then those that discontinued early, and that could be for a variety of reasons, including side effects, for example, or other um, non-treatment-based you know, decisions. Again, only about five, three to six percent. So not common, to come off of hormone therapy early or have disease progress during hormone therapy. So I think that this shows us that it can, it's safe to do. Um, however, it has also shown us that, you know, the markers we currently use to assess difference may not be the best ones. Um, but if we look at those markers for these three arms, there was no difference. So um, the reason I presented this is because I think it's important for people to know that we're really looking for better hormonal treatments for patients who have risk but may not benefit from chemo, and we need better hormone-based treatments, that Faslodex, at least based on this study, does not seem to be better than the current standard. Um, this might be true, or it might be that we're just not looking at the right biomarkers to assess efficacy. Um, it's another, and the other reason I'm presenting this is to let everyone know that we are in process of planning a neoadjuvant endocrine trial using 
what we call an oral surge. So it's an oral version of fulvestrin. Fulvestrin is given um, as an intramuscular injection, which makes it somewhat logistically more complicated and due to the pharmacokinetics, meaning the bioavailability of you know, the body's ability to see that drug and the exposure is more complex, we're hoping an oral version will allow us to actually increase the exposure of the drug. And it might be that an oral version is better and more tolerable than an AI. So that study um, is underway and hopefully will open by the end of the year. Well, that's really interesting, and I think that uh, we could, I don't uh, see any questions popping up about the neoadjuvant endocrine therapy. You'll hear more about this, and when uh, Joe has her study all put together with our colleagues across the United States, we'll talk about it more in our forum, um, I, and so I think that that will be interesting. I think uh, one, one question that did come up, and Joe, I'll just have you quickly answer this so we can uh, get through the next one, is uh, do you think that age affects people's response to neoadjuvant endocrine therapy? Like, could you do this in a premenopausal? This was a postmenopausal population. So could you do this in a premenopausal population? Right, absolutely. It's a great question. Most of the data in the neoadjuvant setting right now is uh, with, in postmenopausal women. Uh, however, we do use neoadjuvant endocrine therapy in premenopausal women as long as we uh, suppress their ovaries. The trial we are planning will include premenopausal women. Um, in fact, in ice by the majority of patients are premenopausal. So we do do it. However, you're right, the data in premenopausal women um, are few, are, there's less data in premenopausal women than in postmenopausal women. So we need to learn to make sure that these responses and treatments are the same. Great. So uh, do we, uh, why don't we go on and move on to this other topic, which I know is um, hard to, uh, is, a, is a tough topic when we think about brain metastases in patients who have metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer, but these are some really exciting results. Okay, so switching gears completely. Um, we're so you may have heard six months ago um, the results of the HER2 climb trial, which is uh, using Ticatinib, which is a HER2 targeted therapy that has a different mechanism than Herceptin and Pergetta. So Ticatinib targets, it's what we call a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It targets the inside of the cell, uh, the part of the receptor inside the cell. And it's a small molecule, it's not an antibody. And there are many drugs in this kind of class that have been studied for HER2 positive disease. And while we believe that they can be very effective, many of these drugs have been um, hindered by the side effect profile. These tend to cause a lot of diarrhea. Ticatinib is unique in that it doesn't bind the HER1 or the EGFR1 receptor as much as the other tyrosine kinase inhibitors do, and therefore does not cause as much diarrhea and is actually quite well tolerated. This trial used ticatinib in combination with Herceptin and Zolota, a chemotherapy, in patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. It was a randomized trial um, using either ticatinib or placebo in combination with Zolota and Herceptin. Next slide. Um, this just summarizes what I just said, and I, the main thing I want to point out here is that this trial allowed patients with active brain meds. Historically, almost all trials excluded patients with active brain meds. So this allowed patients who had, you know, on baseline screening MRI, if they found a new brain med that was clinically stable, they could still go on. Or if they were known to have brain meds previously radiated, but on the last MRI at brain med looked bigger, they could still go on. So this was um, really the first trial that allowed that. And, and again, randomized to catnip placebo, or placebo in combination Zolota and Herceptin. Next slide. So um, the initial results from the main trial were presented and published uh, about six months ago. And what they sh found was really remarkable. Um, there was almost a 50% reduction in the risk of progression um, or death 
33% improvement in survival. And then when they looked specifically at patients who had a history of brain meds, so not everybody had brain meds in this study, again, 50% improvement in their outcomes. So in the last presentation, they didn't actually look specifically at the um, responses in the brain. They just could see that the patients who had brain metastases had improvement in general. So this most recent presentation went deeper and looked specifically at the brain meds data, looking at the response in the brain. Next slide. So they had 291 patients who had brain metastases entering the study. 174 had what they labeled as active, meaning at the time of entry, there was new brain meds that had not been treated or they had previously been treated and were now growing. And then they had 117 patients that had what they called treated and stable brain metastases. So history of brain meds, had radiation, had an MRI that showed that it was either better or stable. Next slide. And what they showed, and so now they're looking at just the brain MRI data, not looking at what's happening in the rest of the body, okay? And so they are reporting out of what, what they call CNS PFS, which is the uh, time of, to progression, meaning how long does it take for the disease in the brain to start growing? And you can see at the 12 month mark, at one year, what is, which is incredible, patients who are getting placebo, who did not get to catnib, um, all of them had progression. Um, however, if you look at the light blue line, so at one year, 40% of them had no progression and were alive and doing well. So just a huge difference. That's a 70% improvement in what they call CNS PFS in terms of prolonging the time to progression of brain metastases. Okay, next slide. And same with survival. So just these patients live longer, 50% improvement. Improvement, next slide. And then this one is really interesting too, where they looked at patients who progressed, they were on the study, their brain meds progressed, they had radi got radiation to the brain meds, and then they kept them on the study with the same treatment. And what they found is if they kept them on the same treatment after radiation, they still had longer time to progression the second time around. So this, so this really supports the idea of even after progression the first time, you can keep the patient on to catnip and they'll still do better than if you stop the catnip. Next slide. Okay. So, um, Basically, this is really exciting. This is practice changing, in my opinion, anyone who has a new diagnosis of uh, brain meds who's HER2 positive should be treated with ticatinib. Um, and I, there's additional studies ongoing to see if we can even move it up further uh, earlier uh, in, in the disease process. So this is actually really interesting data and uh, uh, exciting uh, to hear about. I think you know anything that can help patients who have uh, metastases to the brain is uh, really exciting. Then we see this more frequently in HER2 positive breast cancer. So it ends up being really important and reasonably uh, well tolerated better than some of the other oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors or these oral medications we've used in the past. So uh, that's actually quite exciting for this data. I think as you pointed out, there's a lot of interest in preventing brain metastases in patients at risk. And so studies are going on now to try and add to catnib to other therapy earlier in the course of treatment, even in the early stage setting uh, where patients are at higher risk based on poor responses to treatment uh, and trying to add to catnib to see if we can prevent brain metastases. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and uh, I think you said where you would use this drug. And then Michelle, there was another exciting uh, agent for HER2 positive breast cancer that was recently approved, had accelerated approval from the FDA. How would you se sequence these drugs? One is an antibody drug conjugate called trastuzumab deroxtecan or an HER2. How would you use these two different agents? Um, well, so, I mean, I obviously have a lot more familiarity with this agent because we have, you know, this particular, 
combination, I should just throw out a, a, you know, a plug for our trials, right? That we have a trial looking at this combination in leptomeningeal disease, which is an even more challenging um, and difficult um, complication of metastatic breast cancer where the cancer grows in the lining around the brain. And so in this trial, um, HER2 Climb, they did not actually enroll patients with leptomeningeal disease, but we are studying it and seeing, you know, some, I, I personally am seeing some good response. But in terms of how I would sequence this with um, and HER2, I actually, um, you know, feel much more comfortable with this regimen because I've treated patients with it. And um, also not, um, currently, uh, you know, the, the, this regimen does not result in hair loss. Um, whereas I believe the NHER2 does, patients do experience some hair loss. And um, I think it all comes down to, you know, side effect profiles and what patients, you know, are, you know, what they, they will tolerate. Um, this is an, you know, largely, you know, oral therapy combination with the capecitabine, an average size patient might end up taking, you know, six pills of capecitabine a day and four pills of tucatinib a day, and that might be a lot to swallow. Um, and where, and then of course the trastuzumab infusion. So I think obviously I talk a lot to the patient about what side effects they're they're most um, worried about. And in the situation with COVID, you know the other drug that and her two has this rare toxicity of um, you know in interstitial pneumonitis. And for that in English, you know layman's terms, that means an inflammation in the lung. Um, that can present or manifest a shortness of breath and cough. And that could be difficult right around this time with COVID and not wanting anybody to be coughing unnecessarily and for fear that they might have some, you know, infection. So I, I, for the last three months, I would say I would have favored the tucatinib, trastuzumab, and capecitabine is my long and short of it, the answer. Um, it is interesting, I think. And I uh, you know, oral therapy, some people don't tolerate capecitabine as well as they might, and they get a lot of diarrhea, et cetera. So there may be some differences there, but I think certainly in patients who have anything going on in the brain, we would choose this. And I think your points about COVID and this unknown risk of, uh, of uh, having perhaps some uh, pulmonary toxicity uh, can be very difficult. So um, it's a really good point. Natalie, do you want to add anything to that uh, comment? No, I agree, especially not using uh, the IV therapy in her, in her too, because of the possibility that it could get confused with COVID too, uh, with the interstitial pneumonitis. Yeah, I mean, we've really thought about things a lot differently since there's been COVID around. So um, there, and, and it's uh, fascinating, but having two new drugs that are approved and there's actually another antibody drug conjugate that will be studied. Uh, in, uh, in HER2 positive disease. But I think one of the cool things about trastuzumab deruxtecan, the ADC, despite the lung issue that you talked about, as well as the other ADC from a company called Beyondus, is that they are being tested in patients who are HER2 not positive, but have a little bit of HER2, we've called HER2 low. So those studies are fascinating. And we have uh, a study, we will have a study open in the neoadjuvant setting and one in the metastatic setting looking at this population. So you could have ER positive or triple negative disease, have a little bit of HER2 and uh, be uh, treated on one of these trials, which I think is uh, really interesting. So let's go on now and uh, talk about uh, some other areas. And actually, um, I'm going to have Michelle talk uh, next uh, using this uh, presentation that's here. You know, we've had a, for a long time questions about patients who and have the unfortunate situation of presenting with a primary breast cancer, but already uh, metastases to other organs. And there's been a lot of interest whether or not you should do surgery for the primary tumor. And Michelle's going to talk a little bit about that, as well as a study that looked at uh, the benefits of palliative care in advanced breast cancer. Okay. So um, I think Hope kind of introduced this study, and we'd like to kind of speed things along to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so you can go to the next slide, Hope. And so just as a background, um, you know, we int um, Hope introduced that we had um, have had a number of uh, both trials done, randomized trials done outside of the United States, one done in Turkey and one done in India, that tried to address this question of the role of uh, local therapy, meaning surgery, possibly radiation, axillary lymph node dissection in someone with de novo metastatic disease. And 
uh, I should say that you know, in the United States, especially as we screen patients for clinical trials and we get more systemic imaging like PET scans, CT scans, MRIs, uh, we are finding more and more patients who present with distant metastatic disease. And in some under-resourced countries, um, you know, South America, you know, parts of China, other, you know, other countries, India, certainly the rates of de novo metastatic breast cancer could be as high as 20%. So even though the, the percentage of patients we're talking about in the United States probably falls between 6 and 8%, in other parts of the world, this is a very, very important question. So the design of this trial was that patients um, who were diagnosed with um, de novo stage 4 breast cancer, um, meaning that they had um, evidence of a distant spread in a bone, liver, lung, soft tissue, somewhere else, um, were registered for the study and they were put on a systemic therapy that could have been chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, um, HER2 targeted therapies, a combination. And those patients who did not have progression of their distant disease after a certain number of months of therapy were randomized to continue on that systemic therapy alone or go on to surgery. Um, and that surgery consisted of trying to achieve clear tumor margins and offering post-operative radiotherapy. Uh, and then they were followed for five years. Next slide. And so um, I just wanna show you the population of patients. I won't dwell on this very much, but um, the interesting th one of the interesting points about the data that we're gonna talk about is the fact that there were 390 patients registered, but then 134 of these patients were not randomized. And so the reasons for not being randomized could be either that um, they did not, you know, physician's choice, you know, they thought it would be interesting and then they just decided not to do it, or they didn't actually have control of their disease for that four to eight months. Um, so they didn't meet the criteria for being randomized. Uh, but the point of this slide is to show that, you know, two thirds of these patients that were randomized were postmenopausal. Um, the age was about 56 years old, so that's a higher, uh, higher um, median age, I would say, than we see at the Breast Care Center at UCSF. We tend to serve a, a, a generally younger population of patients, but you can see there's a broad range of age, 25 to 86. And then finally, the characteristics of these patients, um, about 60% were hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative, and about 32% were HER2 positive, um, in the randomized arm and, and a very small number of triple negative patients. And then probably the small number of triple negatives, you see the drop off here is that those patients have a tendency to not remain stable for very long. Next slide. And so this is to cut right to the chase. This is the overall survival data. And you know, if you tried to you know, put a, you know, a needle through these two curves, you couldn't do it. <clears throat> um, what you see here is that um, you know, as of uh, December 2019, you know, that 121 of the uh, patients that had been randomized out of the about 250 patients that had been randomized had actually died. Um, and the median follow-up time was about four and a half years. Um, and uh, we can go on to the next slide to show some other, um, you know, data looking at the tumor subtypes. So the data that um, I mentioned from these Turkish trials and the Indian trial that had been previously published did suggest that there was a subset in the Turkish trial of patients that were hormone receptor positive and who had bone-only metastasis that did benefit from surgery. But in this, when they broke it down by tumor types, you could see here that in fact, the very small number of triple negative patients actually did worse when they actually had surgery. And there was really no difference in the hormone receptor positive or the HER2 positive patients. Now going on to local regional progression, which is the next slide that Hope jumped to, um, this is a very important point because when you take a patient to surgery, if they have an intact tumor in their breast, then you know, lo and behold, you actually see improvements in local regional control, meaning that they don't have regrowth or growth of tumor in the breast. So, and this was fairly substantial. Uh, you know, this, this statistic here, HR or hazard ratio of 0.37, you know, suggest that you're reducing the chances that someone's tumor is going to grow back or grow in the breast or the lymph nodes by about 63%. Next slide. And so um, then they also importantly looked at health-related quality of life using a tool called the FACT-V. That's a, a survey that um, has been used in many, many breast cancer trials. 
to look at both physical symptoms as well as emotional functioning, anxiety, depression, and really at these various time points, both at, you know, at rent out basically from registration all the way out to 36 months, there was no statistically significant difference um, between the quality of life and these arms. And this actually data, this data was perhaps the most surprising to me. And I'll, I'll save a little bit of time for my commentary at the end after the, the next slide, Hope. So, oh, I guess that was my last slide. So what I would like to, you know, comment on here with the quality of life is that, um, so where does this lead us? You know, this trial, um, you know, is the, the only, you know, randomized trial that's reported out in the United States so far. Uh, it's a relatively small study. You know, it, I applaud Dr. Khan and all the people that enrolled to this trial because this is a very, very difficult trial to enroll to. You know, most of our patients that do come in with this scenario of having distant metastatic disease um, at presentation, it's a very, very hard thing to accept. Um, and, and particularly when oftentimes the, the metastatic disease that we detect may be a single bone metastasis or a small lymph node, you know, behind the sternum, you know, what we call mediastinal node. And it, it's very hard for particularly younger women, you know, to accept that they don't have a chance at being cured of their cancer. And that, you know, taking off the tumor and going through the motions of having surgery and radiation, um, you know, that if we tell them, you know, you don't need to do that and they can feel a mass in their breast, it's often very distressing. And so we have had, you know, a lot of consternation, you know, discussion, consternation in our group about this. And basically the long and short of it is that we feel that despite this data showing no overall survival benefit, it's still going to very, very, very much remain a personal and individualized decision, conversation between the medical oncologist, the surgeon, and the patient, and the radiation oncologist. Um, I think for the sake of time, I'll go on to the next presentation. Then we Let's can just- have, Let me just get a- um... Uh, comment. I think this is such important data and really interesting that, you know, we had seen two other studies which are kind of opposed in other countries where people um, really get a very different level of care. And so I think that it's important that we have this particular information in patients who could have gone on to surgery. The problem for me is the subsets and trying to understand that benefit. I do think that, you know, we don't want to um, have patients believe that if you remove this primary, and that might require a mastectomy, and do radiation, you know, sort of noxious local therapies that you're going to live longer, but you may have better local disease control. Natalie, uh, what's your take on this in clinical practice? I mean, I think it depends on the burden of disease of the patient. I, as a general rule, do treat people locally with surgery and or radiation if they have a low burden of disease, and it's something that we're going to be able to control most likely with hormone therapy or the targeted therapies because local progression is a pretty horrible thing to go through as a patient. Um, if they have disease that's very out of control, like a liver that's full of metastases, uncontrolled brain mets, of course, that patient you would concentrate on controlling the, the cancer in the body. But I, I think it's a very individual decision, but I, I have in my practice, treated people locally, even if they had metastatic disease, if it was low burden. And Joe? I think she's You're on, on mute. <laughs> um, I think it's very individual. I, um, I, I think there are many reasons in the study that we, for why maybe we didn't see a survival outcome that's due to the inherent design of the study. But I, you know, I think there are other endpoints to consider when we make this decision. And one of them for me is, can I keep a patient on, let's say, hormone therapy longer um, and, and conserve my treatments and not switch as early to chemotherapy as I may otherwise would have to if I'm chasing local progression, right? And so they're finding, showing that um, there's less local progression with local treatment obviously you know is not surprising but it's really important and it may not be because it impacts survival but it will likely impact needing to change therapy or the time to needing to start chemotherapy and you can say well then how come we didn't see a, a difference in quality of life right like 
we would expect that there would be better quality of life if patients could stay on hormone therapy longer, for example. But I'm not sure that the quality of life would necessarily capture that very well. I, I know in my practice, I have done local therapy in this setting so that I could concentrate on the distant disease when I make treatment changes and not the local because ultimately we know it's the distant disease that's um, more important to control in terms of survival. So, uh, so I definitely, this study would not change my practice. Yeah, I think um, we already ha we had taken a very careful approach to this as a group already working with our surgeons. And so I really agree with you. I think that one of the interesting things that um, is important to keep in mind um, here is there was only 20 patients with triple negative disease. So we really don't know, but I think we've learned from a number of studies that if you stop chemotherapy for triple negative breast cancer, that in the metastatic setting, patients seem to do worse than if you continue therapy. So I wouldn't, unless we had to, stop for you know, uh, problems, you know, pain, et cetera, um, where you had to do something like radiation, I wouldn't stop to do a surgery unless I was really sure the disease was quiet and well controlled and I could continue treatment, for example, immunotherapy. So I think that that's also important as well. Um, Michelle, you want to talk about this study? Sure. So changing gears um, now to from you know the the very very beginning of the diagnosis of metastatic disease to a little bit later down the road. Um, this was a trial um, that you know is uh, you know again I'm plotting the um, you know, the the designers of the trial, the people that were able to conduct it, looking at a trial of collaborative palliative um, care between oncology and the palliative care physicians to improve communication about end of life. And um, I'm gonna have you go to the next slide um, for the sake of time, but I would say that, you know, we at UCSF really have a model um, in our clinic where we have um, something called the Advanced Breast Cancer um, Program where we have embedded um, symptom management service with our, you know, within our clinic um, to try to really get people um, you know, connected with those doctors early on to help symptom, manage symptoms so that, you know, as, as a medical oncologist, I can focus on talking to patients about the, the next line of treatment. And there's another group of doctors that can really focus on symptom management and, you know, really what patients want for the rest of their life in a more global sense. So this study population um, is described here. And so they, they basically named a number, they came up with a number of criteria that sort of define patients for whom we think, you know, that, that time may be somewhat more limited in terms of survival and that those patients really need to consider, um, you know, what their goals are, what they want out of the, the rest of their life and how um, they want to have a representative to, to talk about, you know, what they they'd want at the end of life. And so the criteria are listed here, those with um, CNS disease, so leptomeningeal disease, which I mentioned we have the trial for but it is a very, very, very extremely challenging diagnosis. Progressing brain mets after radiation, although now in the HER2 positive space, we have tucatinib, um, and then brain metastases and starting whole brain radiation. They were also looking at patients that were hospitalized after an unplanned hospital admission, and then patients um, that had been facing changes in treatment, so triple negative disease starting second line chemo, um, others that had received at least three different chemotherapy regimens in a 12 month period, so that probably represents another patient population where their disease is becoming more refractory. And then patients um, beginning a treatment on a clinical trial. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. And so the, what the intervention involved was basically a process where these visits that were happening with the um, palliative care physician approximately every four weeks. Um, and you can see here what happens during the visits. The first visit is to build rapport. The second and third visits um, are happening to help with symptom management, understanding the illness, kind of understanding where patients are at in terms of their coping. And then the last couple of visits were around actually making those decisions and um, coming up with an end of life and advanced care planning. And then they would continue to um, have telephone calls and maintain contact um, to, to kind of keep that relationship going. Next slide. And what they were looking at in terms of the study was actually um, the primary outcome was to actually look to see if there were actually terms in the clinic note. Um, and using this thing called natural language processing, they would actually look through the medical record, the clinic notes, to see if there was anything to suggest that 
there had been a discussion between the patient and the oncologist or the patient and the palliative care doctor about the goals of care and end of life discussions and whether the patient had actually completed this thing called the MULS, the Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. And then there were secondary outcomes that were looking at questions that were specifically asked to the patient. Um, have you and your doctor discussed wishes that you have about the care you would want to receive if you were dying? Um, and then also specifically the question about whether the patient believed if their cancer was curable. They also collected quality of life data, that fact B that we talked about that was in the last study, as well as looking at a specific scale called the hospital anxiety and depression scale. And they looked at these um, after a number of weeks, 6, 12, 18, and 24. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Oops, got to scroll down a little bit to get to the yeah. arrow. Yep. It's supposed and so this to go. Is the, the patient knows? population. And so they started out with a, a the, the, it took them about two and a half years to enroll these patients. Um, they, you know, you can see here that they're, they started out with about 177 patients and then a good number of patients actually deferred. They didn't, they were not interested. They randomized and registered 120 patients. And you can see here that 59% of patients were assigned to the usual care, which really was basically that the patient could actually go to see a palliative care physician if they asked for it or if they were referred by their oncologist. Um, you can see here what happened to the 61 patients who were assigned to the intervention. Um, most of them did participate in the palliative care visits, um, but you know a number of them actually uh, didn't complete all of the visits. Next slide. And uh, we can just go on. And so the, the patient population here um, actually is surprisingly young, you know, for a mean of um, 55 years old for patients to be facing these very, very difficult decisions. Um, the majority of them, you know, were of Caucasian descent. So it's not a very uh, diverse population. And I think this is actually a very important point because I think the way that different um, cultures and different races face these kind of end of life decisions is, is very, very different. Um, you can see here the performance status of these patients, even though they were facing, you know, sort of life threatening disease, they still, uh, you know, almost 50% of them still had very, very good performance status. Um, and you can see here on average, they were about two years since their diagnosis of metastatic disease, 24 versus, yep, next slide. And so what they found, the primary endpoint was that in those arms that were randomized to the intervention where they had these meetings with these sort of assigned dedicated every four week meetings with the palliative care physician, there was a much, much higher rate of documentation of there having been an end of life care discussion in the health record and uh, basically tripling of the rate of patients who actually completed documents that said, you know, what they really wanted to happen at the end of their life. And this has a big, been a big, big push even in the face of COVID um, telling, you know, that we all should have, you know, documents laying around saying what we would want to happen at the end of our life because, you know, a lot of crazy things happen. Next slide. And so then um, there were also these questions about um, whether um, there had been actually reporting um, discussing their end of life preferences um, and, and whether the patient actually recalled that discussion actually happening. So what I think is so interesting is that even though in the note it was documented 60% of the time that this end of life care discussion had happened, interestingly, you know, many patients don't actually remember it happening, um, although it was higher in the intervention arm. What I think is even more interesting is that these are, you know, exclusively patients that have stage four metastatic breast cancer who are, you know, who have, you know, very dire circumstances and a significant number of these patients still believe that their cancer is curable. And, um, you know, I think that may speak to something about, you know, the power of hope um, and also just, you know, the sort of maybe our, our still as oncologists, our inability to sort of well, communicate well to patients, you know, where their disease stands. Um, and so I think the meaning of this, this study is really to show how important it is to have collaboration with our palliative care colleagues so that we can make sure patients are not sort of sideswiped and surprised by their prognosis. Um, and I know it's, it's a very, very hard thing for people to face to say, you know, to really think about um, you know, if they were only diagnosed with metastatic disease a few years ago, and they might think that they have, you know, 10 years ahead of them, and many, many of our patients may, you know, someone who's going on to second or third line endocrine therapy, they could live 10 years. 
but it never hurts um, to have these discussions is the long and short of this presentation, I think. I think that's so great. And I really appreciate you um, going through the data because I think that the support of care that we can provide for our patients is incredibly important in all st settings and all stages of disease. We're very lucky to have our symptom management group where we have a specific subset uh, that meet with our patients who have advanced breast cancer. And we try and have people meet very early on so we're not identifying patients who are you know, have more heavily pretreatment, but really just early on after the diagnosis of advanced breast cancer so that we can help get through the different stages of treatment. So um, we really like that program and I think it's great uh, for uh, our patients and hope that, hope that people will um, uh, use it. Uh, so I appreciate that. I think we have a lot of similarities with what uh, they did in their program that we offer as a, as a central service. So uh, Natalie, do you want to talk a little bit? I know you have a big interest in exercise and uh, Natalie's actually um, has uh, had a lot of experience with exercise and uh, has been uh, herself in, in terms of uh, being um, uh, doing a, an Olympic class athlete. And uh, maybe you can just give yourself a brief background on that. And also um, has been very interested in trying to provide resources for exercise for patients. So. Uh, Natalie's going to talk a little bit about some of the data at uh, ASCO about exercise, and hopefully we'll have time to talk about immunotherapy. Uh, so we'll try and keep this at about 10 minutes, and we can talk about some of the other areas after that. That sounds good. So um, I'm really interested in exercise and its decreasing side effects, but also decreasing risk of recurrence. And then also exercise is something that can be uh, done in order to uh, help people recover after chemotherapy and recovering their cardiac function. I'm an Olympic weightlifter, not because I've been in the Olympics, but because I do the sport of Olympic weightlifting as a master's. So um, I'm gonna just do, I'm gonna talk about two different abstracts. Um, one is uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease in women with and without a history of breast cancer. This was a Kaiser study called the Pathways Heart Study. And it was a huge study because Kaiser has a huge amount of members where they they did a one to five ratio of women who've had breast cancer and were treated with conventional therapy and then women who were controls who had never had breast cancer. And they had about 15,000 women in the breast cancer arm and about 75,000 women in the control arm. So it's a large uh, cohort study. And what they looked at was uh, between 2005 and 2013, they looked at uh, cardiovascular events. And then they looked at, in the breast cancer patients, what, um, what treatments did they get and what cardiovascular events did they have compared to people who'd never been treated for breast cancer. And they looked at whether a person had ischemic heart disease, which would be like coronary artery disease or clogged arteries causing heart attacks. They looked at heart failure, so whether the heart didn't pump correctly and, and caused fluid overload in the body. Um, they also looked at um, stroke as a major endpoint, and they looked at other things such as cardiac arrest, bad rhythms of the heart, um, uh, blood clots that could happen in the lungs or the legs. And um, what they found was that uh, the women that they looked at with breast cancer had an average age of around 62 years, and they were slightly overweight. So overweight, they look at this thing called body mass index. And they were slightly overweight um, at 28 um, was the body mass index and normal is below 25. 65% um, of patients were non-Hispanic white. Um, and the women, what they found was that the women who received chemotherapy were more likely than the controls to develop heart failure, cardiomyopathy, and the blood clots. Cardiomyopathy being uh, like heart failure. Uh, women who had left-sided radiation were also more likely than controls to develop heart failure and blood clots. Um, women who received hormone therapies were more likely than the controls to have um, a blood clot. Um, so what they concluded from the study was that women with breast cancer were at increased risk of heart failure, cardiomyopathy, cardiac arrest, and venous thromboembolism. And these risks varied by what cancer treatment they had but the highest risk was in people that received chemotherapy. So now I want to just say a couple of things. And one is that this doesn't mean that you shouldn't take treatment for breast cancer because people are living a long time now because their cancer is being cured and they're living uh, longer and they can develop these different 
disease states, what they really found is that women who are treated for uh, breast cancer oftentimes can develop hypertension or diabetes, or if they gain weight, they would have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease related to that and the metabolic changes or the, the chemical changes that happen in the body. So I think what this really speaks to is that we need to have uh, programs in place to help people manage their weight and manage their cardiovascular risk factors, especially in breast cancer patients, so that we can lower the risk of these things happening to patients after they're treated. So let's go to the next slide. And I'm gonna just talk about uh, exercise, another abstract about exercise. Um, this was an exercise intervention during chemotherapy or after chemotherapy in cancer patients. And what they were looking at um, is whether or not a person could recover their cardiac function back to the, to the baseline, back to normal. So they, they had exercise programs that were a 24 week program of aerobic exercise. So it could be like moderate walking um, and some resistance training, which wasn't necessarily lifting weights, but it, it was a supervised program of some type of strength training. And what they found is that in a patients that started it with chemotherapy, they could maintain their cardiovascular fitness and also uh, had way less fatigue during treatment if they were exercising during treatment. They also found that if you didn't start with chemotherapy, but you started an exercise program after chemotherapy, that the fatigue recovery was very uh, dramatic. And the heart functioning, which we measure by something called VO2, it's the oxygen uptake of the heart, uh, the maximum heart um, oxygen uptake was recovered to normal as well if you exercised after treatment. Um, and so exercise should be a part of our uh, treatment that we, that we offer people um, and encourage people to do during treatment and also after treatment. Um, I wanna go to the next slide to just talk about uh, a couple of things. So I just was going to say um, one thing was, uh, at, and I know you're going to talk about uh, this a little bit more, but I just wanted to ask Michelle, who's also a big exercise enthusiast um, and uh, runs and is uh, and swims and all sorts of things. Um, how, well, how do you talk to your patients about exercise for in the early stage setting? Yeah, um, well, as you know, you know we did a, a trial trying to give people Fitbits um, to see if we could encourage patients to um, use the Fitbit during um, chemotherapy and, uh, you know, kind of get a sense of how useful that would be because, you know, these, you know, devices are all the rage to try to encourage people. And we are sitting on a load of um, quality of life data to look and trying to analyze, you know, the outcomes of patients, you know, what was the quality of life improvement for patients who actually use the Fitbit and exercise versus those who didn't. We're in the process of, of analyzing that. But, um, I think that I, I believe, and you know, both in the you know the late stage setting in palliative care, is that you know energy begets energy, and I try to tell people that even in um, you know even in the throes of the worst nausea that they have, and it's been hard in the COVID, everything comes back to COVID right now, right? But I, I just tell them, you know, even if they were someone who ran you know an hour to hour and a half a day, that getting out and walking 15 minutes every day matters. And that, you know, that, that just setting small goals for themselves to do little bits of exercise, um, bursts of exercise throughout the day, um, if and if it starts with five minutes. So I'm, I'm pretty, um, I'm, I'm kind of a tyrant about it. Um, I think I nag a lot. <laughs> I nag a so lot. So do I. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I, I know some of my patients in the audience, and I'm like, did you get outside? And when people are telling me they can't go outside because of COVID, I was like, nope, it's not an excuse. Um, you know, I think, you got, I mean, obviously one of the hardest things is for those patients that live in areas that's not safe to go outside. That's really, really difficult. Um, if you live in an area that's unsafe to go outside, either because of safety or, you know, air quality or things like that. But yeah, I, I encourage everybody and I really think it helps. So go to the next slide, Hope, because I'm going to just wrap this up um, with what I really think is important. So in you know, talking about what's modifiable and what's not modifiable. So non-modifiable risk factors for uh, cardiovascular toxicity are like your age, genetics, you may have inherited like a high cholesterol problem from your parents, 
um, the fact that you need to have radiation or chemotherapy to be cured from your cancer, um, or whether you have coronary artery disease because you have risk factors such as high blood pressure or, or diabetes or hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol. Um, but there's also a lot of modifiable risk factors that you can, you can affect. And one is just good nutrition. Uh, the other one is just to be active. Even if you don't lose weight, just being active lowers your risk of cardiovascular toxicity, but it also helps you not uh, have a relapse of breast cancer in many different kinds of breast cancer. Um, obesity can cause breast cancer and by maintaining exercise and trying to control your weight, not necessarily even losing weight, but controlling your weight and not gaining more, that can really help uh, decrease the risk of cardiovascular toxicity, but also your cancer recurrence. And then not smoking and controlling high blood pressure and diabetes. So there's a lot we can do to try to prevent these cardiovascular complications. Um, and I think, you know, having discussions with your doctor about what you can do and your primary doctor as well, I think that we can help educate people so that we can decrease those, those side effects and problems. And I'm just going to stop their hope because I think you should you should go next. Um, okay, I think one thing just to mention that you had in your um, in your slide set here was, um, and we of course always run out of time before we talk about everything, but was this idea of giving Cape Cytobine in patients with triple negative breast cancer? And um, I will say that you know this is kind of interesting, and uh, maybe it's worth a brief mention. And it really comes from the uh, idea that if you know patients have a higher risk of recurrence and because they have triple negative breast cancer, could you do something that would reduce that risk? And we have data from the CREATE X trial that showed that patients who had residual disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, so when they had their surgery, they still had some invasive cancer left. If they got Cape Cytobine, also known as Zalota, after surgery at a bigger dose, two weeks on, one week off that they not only had less recurrence, but lived longer. So that's become a standard of care. And this was a whole different approach, not before, not selecting out patients who'd had neoadjuvant therapy, but just after standard chemotherapy and giving uh, Zalota or Cape Cytobine continuously with no break for a whole year. So I, Natalie, I just uh, maybe go to how well this worked and what your sort of overarching thoughts are about this data. So this is a this is a uh, as Hope said a different study because the patients could have gotten neoadjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant chemotherapy. These were earlier stage uh, patients, so some of them were stage one patients, some of them were stage two patients. Um, about a third of them had lymph node positivity, or almost forty percent, but a large percent of them had lymph node negativity. The tumors were mostly less than um, five centimeters. Uh, as far as um, age goes, uh, the average age was around 45, 46. Um, and what they, what they did was the observation group got just observation. The, the capsidabine group got a very low dose of Zalota or capsidabine every single day. So they got it every day without an eruption. They call this metronomic um, treatment, which means just a small regular dose. And the side effects are much lower when you give a low dose of Zalota. They still had some patients that had the, the side effects that we see with Zalota. But what they found, if you go to the next um, slide, is that there was a statistically significant difference in disease-free survival. Um, it, it was about a 10% difference in disease-free survival of patients who took this daily daily treatment for a whole year of low dose Zalota versus uh, not taking it. Um, the, the important thing about this is that I'm not sure, and, and maybe uh, Joe or, or Hope or, Mil Mil or Michelle, you could comment about, I don't think this would replace the six months of treatment in a person who didn't respond to chemotherapy preoperatively, but for somebody who, who had surgery first, and then they had their general chemotherapy that we always would give a triple negative patient, maybe this would be a treatment that you could potentially offer them that has data because it included patients who had been operated on first. But I think this is very interesting data, and it, it is a treatment that's not that toxic, doesn't cause hair loss, it doesn't cause severe sickness, 
um, in most patients, and I think and is generally well tolerated at these low doses. So it could be something that could lower the risk of recurrence. And this was the distant, okay, yeah, that's right. It's about a 10% difference. Yeah, I think this is really fascinating because when we give, we tend to use a lot, treat most patients with triple negative disease with neoadjuvant chemo or chemo before surgery. And this actually gives another option of delivering drug, albeit much longer uh, in these patients if they don't tolerate the regular capecitabine. I mean, you can get a lot of you know, uh, increased pigment in the skin and pain in your palms and soles and diarrhea and just other issues. So I think that having a lower dose option is good, but I do think taking a year of therapy is pretty tough. Um, I, I don't know how much uh, we would use that, but certainly, um, it gives us an idea that maybe giving capecitabine after standard therapy in the adjuvant setting could be useful. Um, what do you think, Joe? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think the majority of our triple negative patients are probably being treated in the neoadjuvant setting, um, except for maybe patients with very small tumors um, or older patients. And so I think if they're being treated in the neoadjuvant setting, given the create X data, which used the high standard dose Zolota two weeks on, one week off, um, that showed survival benefit, I would still stick to that regimen. Um, but if there is a patient who received, uh, who got surgery first and um, otherwise you know, healthy, I think this is a very good option. I, I think that 10% benefit is, uh, you know, looks very good. Um, so I, I think that's reasonable. But I think most of our patients will probably still still fall into the first bucket, which is neoadjuvant chemo. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, it's a really important point. And you know, you never know how long you should really continue something like this. When you know, should you continue it for a long time or not? Um, it's just uh, very hard to know. So. Um, I'm hoping here that I can uh, share with you uh, my slides, which are somewhere in here. Uh, of course, I didn't have my slides in here. Um, so let's see here. Um, I will get them. I'll share and... And we're just going to briefly talk about these things because we just have a couple of more minutes here. So I just wanted to talk about one area for our patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer where these class of drugs called cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors, inhibitors have really revolutionized the care, showing improved survival in patients who are receiving treatment after an initial aromatase inhibitor when they receive uh, the CDK46 inhibitors in combination with fulvestrant. Uh, but there was a, been a lot of interest in whether or not if you start out with uh, metastatic breast cancer and you're at least a year from your last aromatase inhibitor or you never took one, uh, should you get Fazlodex or fulvestrant where you have to get an injection every month or could you get an aromatase inhibitor instead? And I think that's a big issue because of the I need for injections with fulvestrant and also, of course, our desire to help patients have the best outcome. I will mention, as was mentioned by my colleagues, that there are oral drugs like uh, fulvestrant. They're called SIRDs or selective estrogen receptor down regulators that are in multiple trials and will be in Joe's neoadjuvant hormone trial. So we may see oral options in the future, but uh, what they did with this trial was randomize patients to receive letrozole or fulvestrant with palbociclib, um, and they treated almost 500 women in the metastatic setting. So you have metastatic disease, but you haven't received any treatment yet. Um, and what they saw was that it didn't matter what hormone their partner you used, and the reason why this is important is that another study had suggested that fulvestrant or Fazlodex might be a little bit better than letrozole uh, in patients who hadn't ever received any prior treatment for hormone receptor positive breast cancer. But when you added the CDK46 inhibitor, this difference went away. And basically the progression-free survival was the same or the, and that really means the amount of time that a patient could stay on treatment before their cancer starts to grow again. And it was a reasonably long time at 30, about 30 months overall. But you can see that there were quite a lot of patients who were on this treatment without their cancer growing for well over three years, 
which isn't, I mean, we'd like it to be forever, but I think that this is really encouraging information and suggests that you could give an all oral regimen, uh, like letrozole and palbociclib, or letrozole and another of the CDK4-6 inhibitors like ribociclib or abemaciclib. These drugs are called uh, all by uh, brand names as well, which I think uh, many people are familiar with, Ibrantz, Kiskali, or Verzenio. Um, and you could combine it with an oral agent or the injectable fulvestrin or Fazodex. We have always been interested in trying to, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but to save Fazodex for the next line setting. So you, cause you can combine Fazodex with other drugs, um, other targeted agents. And there's actually a lot of studies going on with these targeted agents that we're participating in that are really exciting. And we hope to be able to further improve outcome in patients with hormone receptor positive advanced breast cancer by these other targeted agents such as drugs like uh, that are called AKT inhibitors and even PI3 kinase inhibitors. And the other thing that was kind of nice to see was that it didn't matter if you had liver or lung metastases or whether you didn't, if you just had, if you had more bone metastases, patients still did very well, uh, regardless of the hormone partner when they had their treatment combined with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. So that's really encouraging. And then I just show you this because um, although we know that uh, it, patients will, and people have metastatic breast cancer, will eventually uh, die of their breast cancer. Some people live a very long time now, and hormone receptor positive disease, we've had much better outcomes now. And so we're really excited about further improving survival and helping patients do better and better and trying to understand how to achieve this. And this is just one step in the right direction. Uh, because we've reached our time at 7.30, I'm going to ask just for uh, some additional thoughts from our panelists and uh, not talk about alpelacib, a PI3 kinase inhibitor. We can talk about it in our next forum. And the other topic that we were going to discuss, and I'll just uh, quickly scroll to that, um, and you know, it's just because there's so many interesting things to talk about, is... Um, immunotherapy for breast cancer, uh, where we're trying to improve the effectiveness of chemotherapy, as well as other treatments for patients with higher risk cancers, uh, triple negative breast cancer. And this particular topic is focuses on triple negative breast cancer in the metastatic uh, setting, uh, using a newer immunotherapy, uh, different immunotherapy approaches. And the study that was presented at ASCO used one called pembrolizumab, but there's also an approved combination with atezolizumab. But uh, also uh, we're using this approach in the iSpy neoadjuvant uh, trial and we've seen patients benefit who have high risk hormone receptor positive disease as well. So there's a lot going on here and we'll be able to uh, look more at that in the future. So uh, I think that what we'll do now is to just stop and I'll ask everybody for their sort of you know, final wrap up comments and what was the really most exciting data that came out of ASCO. You can sort of make a brief comment on that. Joe, you wanna start? Um, I guess I'll choose the one of the abstracts that I presented, which was the ticatinib for brain meds. Um, I, I just think this is practice changing. Um, it's the first drug that we've seen specifically show uh, benefit and outcomes for patients with brain meds in brain meds with overall survival benefit. Um, so I, I think that it's so for me, that's the biggest abstract in breast this year. Natalie. I would have to agree. The tocapinib one was pretty exciting and I put, I'm put i putting my first patient on it as soon as I can, you know, I have a patient that can go on it and I'm very excited about that. Um, so that, that to, for me also. And Michelle. Yeah, I mean, I'm, in, you know, brain meds is what I do. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, other, you know, it's a kind of a weird place between survivorship and brain meds, but um, I think that that definitely this will, you know, sort of change our paradigm about thinking that, you know, we always have to, you know, go forward with radiation when someone is diagnosed. Um, I, you know, just to get back to this, the first drug, I mean, you know, other drugs in this class, like lapatinib with a landscape trial, you know, had shown, you know, that we could try to treat, you know, brain mets without doing radiation, but no one in the U.S. was really brave enough to follow up on that trial. And um, I think that this is a, a space where the other big question is, you know, how often should we be imaging people's brains, um, you know, with the identification if we actually diagnose, you know, small 
brain mets in certain populations, um, you know, the sooner that we know the better and we could treat them with very active agents. So that's a great, uh, a great comment. I think, you know, we are concerned about the toxicity of radiation therapy long term in our patients as our patients are thankfully living longer and longer and having a treatment option that might allow us to avoid either upfront radiation or follow-up radiation for HER2 positive disease is exciting. And it also maybe opens the avenue to finding other drugs for patients with say triple negative disease. This year we've seen approval of an antibody drug conjugate for triple negative breast cancer called sasituzumab govotecan or Trudelvi. And I think we're also really excited about uh, with responses in patients who have metastatic triple negative breast cancer and pretty good tolerance. You know, it doesn't cause a lot of toxicity. We talked about the approvals of two new drugs for HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, and then the data at uh, ASCO, which further showed efficacy of immunotherapy, so that we have a lot of expanding information about immunotherapy now for the treatment of triple negative breast cancer, where we see patients are benefiting and can move these drugs into early stage breast cancer and hopefully cure more women uh, with both uh, triple negative disease and high risk uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer, where the cancers are really uh, growing quickly. And then there's also some studies looking at this approach in HER2 positive disease as well. So a whole lot of information, really exciting data. I appreciate all of the time that you uh, all put into putting these together, putting together the slides and discussing this so nicely, answering everybody's questions. It's just great and uh, great to be able to communicate with everybody by Zoom. To the audience who are still on, please send uh, Melody any comments you have back to the email about the forum. Uh, we will uh, normally we would have our next forum in September, but with Zoom we may be able to do an extra focused forum over the summer. Uh, we have lots of topics we're happy to talk about. We'd like to get your feedback on how this forum worked for you, whether or not this is an appealing way to have our forum by Zoom, and also your ideas for future topics. Thank you very much to Michelle, Natalie, Joe, and to Melody for her um, incredible work as a volunteer making this happen. And I wish you all have a great evening. Take care.